Carrie uh, Torgerson Malcolm served for 15 years as a missionary to the Philippines. Now, she grew up as a missionary kid in China. And as a teenager, she was conv- confined for a time during World War II. She was in an internment camp. While she was there, she discovered a deep truth that changed her life. Now, in the camp, she was number 16. And only one of many Westerners who sought self-identity and comfort behind the walls and electric fences that separated them from the outside world. There were other missionary kids in the exact same predicament as her, and often they would manage to get together, and for a few moments at least they would pray. Now what they would pray for is they would pray for freedom. But as time passed, Carrie began to feel uneasy about these times of prayer. Freedom had become the ultimate goal in their life. And God seemed to become less and less important. Except for his answer of their prayer for freedom. So she began to pray by herself and began to search scripture. And Carrie came to a new outlook on life. She no longer desired to join the others in their prayer for freedom. It was only when Carrie was able to pray this prayer that it changed her life. And this is the prayer she started to pray. Lord, I am willing to stay in this prison for the rest of my life. If only I may know you. Lord, I'm willing to stay in this prison for the rest of my life. If only I may know you. And at the moment she began to pray that prayer, she found that she was truly free. Let me ask you a question. How many of us could pray the same prayer? How many of us have made our ultimate goal simply to know God and to know Him continuously better and better each day? How many of us have discovered the truth that prayer is not just a means to an end. It is intimate communication with the lover of our souls. Today I want to start a new series. I want us to start on an adventure in prayer. We're going to start a series based on a book that Greg Pruitt wrote. It's called Extreme Prayer. Maybe you have already uh, seen a push toward deeper prayer here at Central. We, we've been encouraging people to, to, to involve themselves in a prayer room before service or during service. We've been wanting people to, to pray for the leadership and, and lift them up daily and continuously. The elders have set aside time to, to pray for the direction of the church and, and for all of you. This is not a coincidence. This is God moving among His people. At the beginning of this year, actually at Christmas time, I was given this book, Extreme Prayer. It was a gift given to me. In fact, it was given to all of the staff. We had already started something else in our our studies, and we did that for a month or two after that. But then we decided, hey, let's start looking through this book. And so we started reading chapter by chapter and then praying. Then the elders decided that they would do the same. And so each week they have been reading through the chapters of this book and then praying. We realize that there's power in prayer and we wanted to get the congregation involved and so we set aside a classroom for, for prayer. And then I began to look through my preaching calendar more closely. A group of preachers, we get together every single week. There's about 10 of us. We get together and we pray for each other and we talk about our sermons and we kind of help each other out. But, But once a year we get away and we have this retreat where we go and we plan out the next year's sermons. The entire calendar for next year, for this year, has been planned out. The problem was I wasn't able to be there at the beginning of the retreat. I, I can't remember something was going on. I can't remember if it was a surgery or, or a funeral service, but something was going on and I had to go down a little bit late. And so when I got to the retreat, 
Most of the calendar had already been done. I only got to work on the last three or four months. So at the end of this year, if the sermons aren't quite as well or as good, you know what happened with those. But as I started to review my preaching calendar, I realized that today, the very first Sunday in May, we were supposed to start preaching through this book. This book that I was given as a gift. This book that we've been reading through and praying about. This book that the elders decided that they wanted to participate in. This book was on my preaching calendar. And I am convinced that it is God leading us to pray. In fact, I am convinced that if we pray, not only will we be changed, but God will transform our community through the influence of His kingdom here. So as we start this series, as we go through this series, I want to encourage you, if you have the opportunity and the means, go and buy this book and read it and pray and study and delve closer into your relationship with God. So today I want to to preach a sermon looking at the chapters that they entitled The Blank Check and in his name. And as we, we get ready to pray this or preach this sermon and pray these prayers, I want to encourage you dive deep with God, come close to him, and recognize that Jesus promises to give us whatever we ask. Now, listen to what he says John 14. If you have your Bible, turn me to John chapter 14. We're going to start in verses 12 through 14, but keep your finger in your Bible because I'm also going to be looking at uh, chapter 15 a little bit this morning. So if you keep your finger in your Bible around John 14, you'll be in good shape. But John 14, starting in verse 12, this is what it says. Jesus says, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, I don't know about you, but that passage gives me goosebumps. Jesus tells Christians, he says, hey, you're going to be doing what I've been doing. You're going to do even greater things than that. And then he adds on this little addendum and he says, by the way, whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to give it to you. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a game changing passage. Jesus is essentially telling us, ask and and you will receive. What does that mean? Does that mean that I can ask God for a brand new 2015 Corvette so that I can make faster calls for him? Now, don't laugh at my request. You were thinking the same thing. Maybe not a Corvette. You had something else in mind. Have we turned prayer into a genie's lamp where as long as we rub it correctly, that all of a sudden we get to call out to God, would you give me, would you give me, would you give me? Well, before we start shouting out selfishly what we want God to shower upon us and send our way, I think it would be important for us to kind of look closely at this passage. Because in this passage, there are these parameters, as it were, that that God sets up for this kind of prayer. In our text and in the next chapter, we're going to see a a few different things that God says, pray in these ways, and and I am going to answer your requests. So what requests... What prayers is God eager to answer? That's what I want to look at this morning. What prayers is God eager to answer? And I think we need to start where John chapter 14, verse 12 starts. And that is this. We ought to be praying, Lord, stretch my trust in you. Stretch my trust in you. In verse 12 of our text, Jesus tells us, If you have faith in me, if you have faith in me, you will do what I've been doing and even more than that. Jesus says, if if you have faith in me, if you'll walk with me and, and trust in me and step out with me, where only I can accomplish things, then you will see me working. Then you will see what I can really do. Then you will know 
what it means to be my child. Remember Hebrews 11 verse 1. This is Hebrews 11 verse 1. Here's the uh, definition of faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That is an extremely important passage of scripture for our walk with the Lord. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. If we can accomplish it on our own, if we can see the way in which things can happen, then we really aren't living by faith. At that point, we're living by sight. God calls us to live by faith. And so Jesus says, if you have faith in me, these things will happen. Lord, stretch my trust in you should be our prayer. The second prayer God is eager to answer is, Lord, use me to bring you glory. Jesus tells us in verse 13 of our text, I will answer your request because I want to bring glory to God. I want, I want God to be exalted. Think about that for just a moment, what Jesus is communicating to us. He's telling you, if your first love is God, then all of your requests should be motivated out of that love for God. If our love is for God, then, then our request should be those things that bring God glory and honor. Selfish requests should be replaced with the desire of our heart the desire to exalt our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let me be used to bring you glory, Lord. I was thinking about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 came to my mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then listen what he says. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. I'm going to let you in on a little secret this morning. God hasn't called you or me because of what we can bring to the table. It's not what we can bring. Instead, we have all been called to show the world what God brings to the table. It's for His glory, not mine. In fact, the weaker we are, the more it shows the strength of our God. The Lord is eager to answer a prayer that brings Him glory. Use me to bring you glory, Lord. But on we go. John 15, verse 7. I want you to listen to this verse. It says, if, Jesus is still talking, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Which leads to this third parameter this morning. And that is, we need to be praying this prayer. Lord, help me reflect Jesus. Help me reflect Jesus. Jesus calls us to remain in Him. He calls us to allow His words to capture our hearts and our minds. In other words, Jesus says, Hey, look like me, live like me, serve like me, speak like me. Be me. Be Jesus to this world. That's the call. That's the call. Be Jesus to the world around us. See, God answers our prayer when we ask Him to let us be the hands and feet of Jesus. God answers our prayer when we say, Lord, find us places to serve and find us places to sacrifice for Your kingdom. In fact, I love what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The very beginning of that verse, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. What a prayer. What an idea. Let Christ shine in our lives. Let us reflect Him. Let us show the world who He is by what we do on His behalf, by what we say. 
And then the last parameter is found in John 15, verse 16. And in John 15, verse 16, this is what we're told. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Once again, there's a prayer that God is eager to answer. And that prayer could be worded like this. Lord, use me to change people's eternities. Use me to change people's eternities. Jesus tells us, he says, hey, you've been called to bear fruit. Not any kind of fruit, but fruit that lasts. Now, there might be some debate about what Jesus is referring to here. But I believe this is a direct reference to souls of people who were destined for hell, but have been changed and transformed by the blood of Christ and now are going to heaven. That's fruit that lasts. That's fruit that lasts for an eternity. That is the call we've been given. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. He says, go out there and change people's eternal destiny. That is a prayer that God eagerly answers. Lord, use me to change people's eternities. In Colossians 4 verse 3, this is what Paul asks us to pray or asks them to pray. He says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Lord, give me opportunity to share the good news with someone, to change a life, to make a difference, to change someone's eternal destiny. Helen Rosevere is a medical missionary. She's an author from England who served for years in the former Belgian Congo. And she tells a story about prayer. I want to relate that story to you. This is what she says. She says, One night I had worked hard to help a mother in the labor ward, but in spite of all we did, she died, leaving us with a tiny premature baby and a crying two-year-old daughter. We would have difficulty keeping this baby alive because we had no incubator and we had no special feeding facilities. Although we lived on the equator, nights were often chilly with treacherous drafts. One student midwife went for the box we had, we had for such babies and, and the cotton wool the baby would be wrapped in. Another went to stoke the fire and, <coughs> excuse me, and fill a hot water bottle. But she came back shortly in distress. She told me that while she was filling the water bottle, it burst. Rubber perishes easily in tropical climates. And then she told me, and it is our last water bottle. Water bottles don't grow on trees. There's no drugstore down the forest pathway. All right, I said, put the baby as near the fire as you, as you safely can. Sleep between the baby and the door to keep it free from drafts. It is your job to keep this baby warm. The following afternoon, or the following noon, I should say, as I did most days, I, I went to have prayer with the children in the orphanage. They gathered with me, and I gave the youngsters various suggestions about things they could pray about. And in those suggestions that day, I told them about this tiny baby. I explained the problem that we were having, keeping him warm. And I mentioned that the hot water bottle had broken and that this baby could easily die if it got chills. I also told them about the two-year-old sister crying for her mother who had died. During the prayer time, one 10-year-old girl, Ruth, prayed the usual blunt conciseness of our African children. She said, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. While I grasped inwardly at the audacity of her prayer, she then added, and while you're about it, 
Would you send a dolly for the little girl so that she knows you really love her? As often with children's prayers, I was put on the spot, she said. Could I honestly say amen? I just did not believe God could do this. Oh yes, I know that he can do everything, but the Bible says so, but, but aren't there limits to what God can do? The only way God could possibly do this particular prayer would be to send me a parcel from my homeland, and I had been in Africa for almost four years at the time and had never, ever received a parcel from home. Anyway, if anyone would send a parcel, who in their right mind would put a water bottle, a hot water bottle, in a parcel that goes to the, the equator? Halfway through the afternoon, while I was teaching in the nurse's training school, a message was sent to me that there was a car at my front door. By the time I reached my home, the car had gone, but there on the veranda was a large 22-pound parcel. I felt tears pricking my eyes. I could not open this parcel alone, so I sent for the orphanage children. Together we pulled off the string, carefully and tying each knot. We folded the paper, taking care not to tear it unduly. Excitement was mounting. Some 30 or 40 pairs of eyes were focused on this large cardboard box. From the top, I lifted out brightly colored knitted jerseys. Eyes sparkled as I pulled them out. Then there were the knitted bandages for the leprous patients that we had. But the children looked a little bored. Then came a box of mixed raisins and sultans, and we would use those to make a nice batch of buns for the weekend. Then as I put my hand in again, I felt it. Could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out, and yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle. And I cried. I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that He would. Ruth was in the front row of the children, and she rushed forward crying out, If God sent the bottle, He must have sent the dolly too. And she began rummaging through the, bo through the box. When she finally got to the bottom, she pulled out a small, beautifully dressed doll. And her eyes shone. She had never doubted. Looking up at me, she asked, Can I go over with you, Mommy? And give the dolly to the little girl so, so that she will know that Jesus really loves her. That parcel had been sent five months earlier. Packed up by my former Sunday school class whose leader had heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle even to the equator. And one of the little girls had put a dolly in the box for an African child five months before, an answer to a believing prayer of a 10-year-old girl on that afternoon. I want you to think just for a moment about what extreme prayer is. I want you to think for a moment about what God can do. God provided what they needed and He provided it that day. How audacious, how courageous, how needed in the church. It was a prayer of complete trust. It was a prayer that brought absolute glory to God. It was a prayer that showed a little girl who lost her mom that Jesus really did love her. And it was a prayer that changed lives. In fact, I bet it had eternal ramifications in the lives of those who are there. God is calling us to pray, to ask in His name, to pray extreme prayers. The question is, are you willing to obey? Are you ready to really pray? Lord, stretch my trust in You. Lord, use me to bring You glory. Lord, help me to reflect Jesus. Lord, use me to change people's eternal destinies. Will you pray? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come this morning reaching out to you, desperate to have you transform our lives, desperate to stretch our faith, Desperate to be used by you. 
desperate to change people's lives, desperate to show them Jesus. Lord, I pray for each one here. I pray that these prayers will be a part of their prayer life every single day. Lord, we come knowing that you desire to eagerly answer prayers that bring you glory, that change lives, that stretch our faith, that make us look like your son. Lord, I pray for each one here. I pray that we will not talk about prayer, but that we will actually pray on our knees in the morning and then through the day and through the night that we will pray that it will be a priority and that it will be continuous and that it will be a, something that we are always involved in to bring you glory. Lord, let each person here be touched powerfully when they pray desperately to you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.